Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar. Our goal for this afternoon is to give you the key points that international suppliers should keep in mind in order to ensure that they will have a successful project in Finland. My name is Claudia Greiner. I'm a partner here at Bergman Attorneys and I will moderate our webinar today. We are presenting this webinar together with Econia. Sitting next to me is Marit Mayasari. She's sales manager and senior consultant at Econia. And Marit will today inform us about the different requirements that foreign suppliers have to comply with when they participate in construction projects in Finland. And on my other side is my colleague, Peter Jaspers. He is also a partner in our law firm. And Peter will start off our webinar today with a market overview on the Finnish construction sector. And a little bit later, Peter will also tell us about contracting and change management in Finnish projects. We have prepared a number of presentations, but of course we would also really much like to answer any specific questions that you may have on this topic. So if you take a look at your Teams client or your browser, you will find a chat function there. Uh, so please post any questions you may come up with uh, during the webinar and we will then try to answer. Um, but then it's also time to start with our first presentation, a general outlook on the Finnish construction sector. And for that, I'm handing over to Peter Jaspers. Please, Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, welcome to everybody from me as well. It's great to have you all here. Um, so I have a double task today. First of all, I will say a couple of words very shortly about uh, how construction is doing in Finland and uh, where are the best slots for, for international companies to participate. Um, later I will do a bit more works about uh, legal aspects of construction work in Finland. Um, but uh, straight into the matter, um, market overview, how are we doing in Finland? Um, first observation is uh, that we are seeing a little downturn in the construction market. We have a 2% decrease. That's a, um, uh, prospect, uh, that's a forecast for 2020. 2% um, uh, less construction activity, 4.5% less uh, investments. But that's the overall construction market that includes um, um, apartment construction work, and that is actually the main trigger for this little downturn. Uh, when we look at the projects that are more interesting for international companies coming to Finland, we are actually seeing a pretty good situation. In, in, uh, industrial construction projects are on the rise, and also uh, traffic infrastructure is promising pretty good projects in the near future. First, a small selection of uh, big industrial projects in Finland. There are hundreds, but uh, these are maybe the most interesting at the moment. Uh, I mean, this is a classic Hanji uh, Kivi one, the new nuclear reactor that's coming to Pyhajoki under the um, control of Venlo Boima. It's a huge project, uh, more than 6 billion euros, total investment sum. Uh, we are looking at a slightly delayed schedule that's uh, more or less on the licensing side where that happens, but uh, we are forecasting that in 2021 there will be a construction license coming from the government and uh, 2028 is the prospective completion date. In those years that fall in between is a lot of work and uh, we know that from projects in earlier years. Uh, there will be many, many foreign companies coming to Finland. We have a bit different structure this time. I mean, you probably are aware that there has been or still is a construction site in Olkiluoto, where also a nuclear reactor is still being built. That was a French contractor. Now we have a Russian main contractor, Rosatom, 
they will bring a lot of Russian companies to Finland, but uh, it is also very clear that a huge proportion of the overall work will be contracted out to companies from all over Europe. Then one big, uh, big project relates to energy storage. There's a big investment coming up in Harjavalta in Finland uh, for a battery material factory. German BASF is making that investment. Construction is uh, starting, well, it should start this autumn. It will probably be a bit delayed, but uh, there is a lot of work to be there done, done there as well. And then I have three projects on my list that are um, a future uh, industry, really. Um, bio products, biomass. It's a product from, from Finnish classic, from the uh, forest industry. You know that uh, wood and paper has always been a stronghold in Finnish industry. Now we are going with our wood and with our paper to, to move into the future and produce uh, biofuel and uh, other related products. There are three big projects in the pipeline all over Finland. Uh, investments in the billion euro scale, and we have a couple of smaller ones as well. Traffic infra infrastructure is also very interesting because the new Finnish government has put that on their agenda very strongly. They have just approved an increased annual infrastructure budget uh, increased by 300 million euros. So um, this increase goes almost entirely into rail infrastructure. There's going to be a project called Suomi Rata that's actually a uh, pile of many projects that are just uh, um, put under that headline. Many uh, different fast rail connections throughout Finland that are going to be built or improved. And then we have in the already ongoing construction in Helsinki of the Western Metro, also a huge investment. And uh, well, the rail tunnel to Tallinn used to be a dream for the future. It's now it turns out to be pretty real. We have two competing projects, actually, one from a private investor and one uh, sponsored by the government. It's not quite clear yet which one of those will be realized, but uh, it certainly looks like uh, this project in one form or the other is going to happen, and that will also attract a lot of foreign companies to do the That's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you for now, and I'll be back with legal stuff later. Thank you, Peter, for setting the scene for us. Uh, as we have heard, there are lots of opportunities for foreign suppliers uh, in Finnish projects. But then, of course, the question arises, what kind of specific requirements do foreign uh, suppliers need to comply with uh, when they participate in construction activity in Finland or when they post workers to Finland? And that is also the topic of our next presentation. Uh, Marit Maja Salmi will inform us um, about these items. So I'm handing over to her for the next presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here with you and with our listeners. Uh, I will shortly present Econia and then we go forward to the uh, issues that are needed when uh, before you enter the site in Finland and uh, then later on when you are actually actively operating in Finland. Um, I will try to go through the material <coughs> uh, for the main parts, but of course, please make your questions and come back to us if, if you still have questions. So Econia is a financial administration and HR company. We have locations in 13 um, cities in Finland, and we have a headquarter in uh, Ulvila on the west coast of Finland. We employ more than 100 uh, employees, and uh, we 
Basically, these people are doing work on payroll and uh, HR services. We also have an international team. Over 200 employees are also outsourced through our HR services. Our turnover is about 10 million euros, and we have a good financial situation in the company and are certified accordingly. We are privately owned and independent of change. In our international division, our services are, the main services are final administration and HR services. So also staffing, recruiting and, and all HR services that uh, relate to this area. In the next slide, I go through in more detail our services. So uh, what is unique in Econia is that you can have a very good um, amount of services under the same roof. We have a company set up consulting, which means basically that we discuss the uh, um, status of your company, how it should be registered in Finland and uh, what all issues relate to this, to this issue. We provide financial administration accounting, payroll, and tax consultation. We act as local uh, representative for posted workers. And like I said before, we have also HR services, so we can act as an employer of record for you also. We provide information on the liability documentation needed for site access and uh, consultation relating to this. Tax consulting in all these issues is, is very important and mostly needed by, by most of the foreign companies. And also one specific area is uh, consult consultation in the working conditions. So where do we locate or the question is more, where do our customers locate? They have projects in wind power, plants they have in refineries, your product needles like to set here before what is happening in Finland. We have customers at shipyards and nuclear power plants and actually everything the, for the international companies, our services um, have started from the nuclear power plant in Okiluoto. The companies are subsidiaries or branches of foreign companies and of course we also uh, help our customers to uh, set up a new Finnish limited company. There are also private entrepreneurs, so we have a good uh, many size of uh, companies that we uh, service. One important issue and growing issue is also uh, that we act as a uh, payroll manager for, for and, and do this employment outsourcing also for international payroll and recruitment companies. So here's Oakland. Okay, so, so more issues on, uh, on the information that you need to see when you are entering Finland. When you come to Finland, you, of course, you need to understand that we, uh, we are acting here on based on Finnish law and taxing rights. Uh, there are employee taxation, corporate taxation and VAT liability issues. We also have an act on posting of workers that you need to follow. There is a um, strong uh, act on the contractors' obligations and liability that needs to be followed. It's very important to know which uh, collective agreement your employees need to be following. And then you need to know what is the tax treaty that your country and Finland has agreed on. Uh, Finland is following OECD commentary over the model tax convention, so um, you know how, how the decisions are made actually. And then you, of course, have, depending on the site where you're working, you need to follow the uh, different ISO and such regulations. Also, occupational safety regulations. So, what is the situation that uh, you, your people or your companies 
facing when you are entering Finland. You have you located at, at the site where you have made your contract to, and um, you you are maybe one part of the subcontractor chain. But uh, here on the right corner, you will see that there are these um, issues that you need to uh, consider. Uh, participants like uh, tax administration, Finnish insurance companies and such. And we are here to help you to see that actually your employees will be able to enter the site. Uh, so that they are not staying at the gate control and waiting for the access. So depending on the contract that you have signed, uh, the project timelines looks a little bit like this. There has been the offer and the, probably even the signing phase. So um, with this timeline, we try to show that uh, it would be very good to contact uh, partners in Finland, law offices and a company like Econia before you even sign anything so that we can then uh, provide you information uh, to be in time when the site access is actually taking place. So there, the very big issue is the company's legal structure and then issues like did you make a contract that is lasting for more than six months, 12 months or even 18 months? What does it mean? What is your tax treaty telling our authorities? Um, what happens if you stay here more than six months? What happens with your employees? There's a contractor's obligation and liability law that needs to be followed and uh, local representation issues. So once more, what is important are these questions. How long is your contract? Are you leasing? Are you a subcontractor? What is your role in the chain? Um, and most of you are probably working on construction site, but do you have all the documentation ready for your site access? And do you know what is uh, agreed in your collective agreement that you have maybe even signed with your contractor already? Do you need to have payroll? Um, and then maybe for someone, this is the first time you access Finland. So some planning should be done to see how the future will look like. So before your site, before your site access, you should understand uh, different issues that will affect the site access. You need to have time to prepare all the documentation. You need to have thought about accounting and payroll management. And like earlier said, what is the company setup that you will um, start working on? Of course, you can make changes, but it's very important to know it in the beginning. Will you need tax counseling uh, and other like permanent establishment arising for your company? Are you VAT liable? Are you then also, you need to pay corporate tax and what other tax declarations do you need to do? And uh, if you are um, sending uh, posted workers to Finland as your employees, then these employees need to have a local representation in Finland. And of course, the reporting requirements depending on the setup that you have chosen. And the legal obligations and uh, legislation for the contractors obligations and liability also, this is very important to understand what is meant with this. And uh, all in all, um, what is the status of your employees? Uh, do they have the residence permits? Uh, are they coming from EU or are there any needs to look into this issue? What about your insurances? Uh, do you have A1s for your employees? And uh, maybe you need even bank accounts in Finland. Maybe you need more employees to, in your, your, um, to have a successful project in Finland. Here's 
um, a picture showing many uh, authorities. We will not go through it, but you can use it then later on. So depending on the phase of your project, you will most likely um, have some communication between these authorities. Uh, I would also like to shortly say something about the business culture itself. Um, uh, I have written here that Finnish authorities are, are reliable. And this means that uh, we do have a very good uh, communication um, with, with authorities in Finland. So, so the importance of documentation is very, very important. Uh, if you can show that um, what you have uh, agreed and how, how everything has been made, there is a good chance that you can uh, you can uh, settle your things with Finnish uh, tax office, for example, or even with, with other authorities. Um, of course, you need to know what you have contracted, uh, what what's the content in it, and um, construction uh, sector is very controlled. So, uh, as an example, the tax numbers needed for your employees when they enter site. So, um, and of course, uh, depending on the site where are you, where you are entering, it may vary a, a little. But basically, construction sites are are ruled uh, very well in Finland. You have EU reg regulations to follow. But there are also local issues like trade unions or shop stewards that have their own uh, power and they they will then tell tell how things are to be done at their sites. So it's very important to know the collective agreements. Uh, it could be that even uh, the wages need to be uh, shown that they are paid, paid by the banks and you need, might even uh, need to show the pay slips. Econia provides local representation service for, for our customers and uh, this means that we will um, take care of the archiving for your information that it needs to be archived for your posted workers. Uh, we help you with the uh, working conditions. There could be even a situation that a uh, trade union has uh, made some questions to your employee and, and uh, we might then need to uh, be there to help you with it. Uh, we can also be your partner towards even your contractor in case there's something that needs to be cleared. We do the uh, needed notifications. Uh, and then in the start, starting phase, we provide the um, needed uh, documents for the uh, contractors' liability issues. Um, as a financial administration house, we then, of course, have also the access to open uh, an account for, for you in Finland and in this way to uh, be in contact with the tax office. We are pleased to inform that we can use uh, quite a few languages in our team. Uh, but the uh, official uh, correspondence will be made in, in English. Here is uh, shortly a list of um, obligations and liabilities that you uh, need to uh, show to authorities when you access the site. Uh, I will not go through all these. You will see all these documents that are needed. Please turn to also to Finnish Työsuojelu, um, Regional Health and authority, Safety Authority. There's a lot of information for you to see. And then after registration in Finland, here's also some comments that you need to look into, that you need to um, Visit, for example, your employees need to visit tax office. Uh, you need to take care of your bookkeeping. You need to start payroll. If if this is the case in your your company, you should note the 183 days ruling for your employees. If they stay longer in Finland, 
their personal taxation will turn to fin Finland most likely. You should uh, consider the uh, possible uh, rising of permanent establishment. Do you need these insurances in Finland or can you provide a once all these issues? And as a success factor, we would say that please always contact a consult or expert in, in, in Finland. And as said already, please choose a, a company structure. Uh, think about it in the beginning. Is it a foreign company? Is it a Finnish limited company? Or what is it? We, we are happy to discuss this with you. And uh, then please take care that you have enough information about the contract you have or are going to sign. And get acquainted with your tax treaty with Finland. Here's also a link to uh, Finnish tax office's website. There's a lot of information regarding exactly this item so it's good to go through that too it takes more than one hour but anyways it's very good information and we would be happy to help you out please um, you can now uh, go into this site of ours and there's a place for you to book some appointments if you want to discuss your company situation with me i have booked um, times for you for the next three days. So I would be very pleased to have um, an appointment from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marit, for this uh, very comprehensive overview. That was quite a long list of uh, aspects that uh, foreign companies need to keep in mind. So it's good to know that there is an experienced company like Econia who can help you to get all your ducks in a row, so to speak. Um, I see that we so far haven't received any questions in our chat, so I think that means that your presentation was quite exhaustive. <laughs> mm, but anyway, you still have to, the chance to post your questions and we can also still uh, answer questions at the end of our webinar. Uh, but before we do that, um, we move on to our next presentation. Um, my colleague Peter Jaspers uh, will next tell you a little bit more about construction uh, contracts and change management uh, in Finnish projects. Yes, thank you, Claudia. Yes, it's uh, me again. Before I start, maybe I forward a bit through our slides. Um, the right one. We have um, here Maritz, uh, mm -hmm. Maritz contact data. Now it's visible. Um, so um, you will get all these presentations obviously by email after this event. So um, you don't need to write this down now. We can uh, proceed to our legal presentation, contract practices and change management. Um, I'll try not to make this all too legal. So when we talk about contract law things here, yeah, I, I try to concentrate more on legal culture than on the little details on what has to be done in each contract. That's anyway very individual and depends on the project. Um, I want to give you a bit of an understanding of where you're, what you're dealing with when you're coming to Finland. Mm. First of all, a couple of words, what kind of legal system do we have? Finland is part of the Nordic legal tradition. So um, we do have written law that's different than, for example, in, in uh, the UK or in great parts of, of the USA, where much is case law. We do have written law, but uh, I, I wrote here into the brackets, but not so much. The Finnish legislator is not as uh, uh, eager to put everything into law as maybe in some other countries. So we have also many things that are actually not covered by any uh, written statute. Um, we also uh, we are a small country and uh, we do not have as many legal researchers uh, running through universities and uh, going through every little question. 
we have a limited amount of research material. Um, that is a good and a bad thing. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to find exhaustive answers to uh, individual questions, but it also leaves a bit of room for, for common sense, so to say. Mm. Finns like to pursue practical solutions and uh, they don't rely so much on formalities. Uh, when you write a contract, it's not so much about what words you use or what font you use, but it's more about what's the core of the matter. And then one very important thing, individual fairness. I believe that fairness is probably an objective of most legal systems, but uh, in Finland or in the Nordic legal tradition, really the focus is on individual fairness more than like general. Like in general, maybe you can try to make fair laws, but in Finland, one looks at the individual case and see what's fair there. And uh, then you may find a different results than by simply applying some written rule. I have one slide on publicity and transparency. That's maybe related to Marit's point about uh, Finnish authorities being reliable. They sure are. They are also very transparent. That's a very important legal principle in Finland. They um, uh, keep everything that they're doing public for everyone to see. So you can easily access registers. That's for one. That's very good in day-to-day -day work. But also if you're interested in what uh, the company next door has been doing in their, in their permits application, for example, you go to the relevant authority and uh, ask for it and you will get all the paperwork that's in there. Of course, it may be an issue that there are business secrets in there. So if you have your own uh, business matters going to Finnish authorities, you may want to uh, make sure that business secrets are recognized as such. Also, personal information is public, tax information. So um, uh, do not rely on tax authorities keeping your figures secret and also court files are public. All that is, uh, is very good for knowing uh, your way through Finnish authorities, through the legal system, but it also means that you have to account for other people looking at your stuff. Contract law and contract culture. Uh, as I said, I want to concentrate on the course uh, lines of what contract law is about. So um, let's try to do this with a little drawing that I have scribbled on this slide. Um, we have uh, something that I call the contract iceberg. So here you have the, the wide blue sea and you see a contract document. And uh, as you can probably conclude from the headline, this is not all that there is. A contract in Finland consists of much more, something that is probably the case in most jurisdictions is that there are legal provisions, statutes that uh, complement something that is maybe not written in the contract. So um, when the legislator goes and thinks in these or those contracts, it's fair to act in these and these ways unless agreed otherwise, then that's of course also part of the contract, unless you agree otherwise. But that's not all at all. Um, in Finland, ad hoc agreements and uh, parties' common practices have a very strong standing in contract law. So if you um, have a contract and the next day you go about with your contract partner and do it a bit differently or even hugely differently, then um, that very soon will turn into your contract and uh, it's very hard to rely on contract clauses that state something that is more or less obviously in opposition to what the parties actually have done and so the contract actually will lead its own life. And then business practices and fairness. Business practices means uh, what do other businesses in the same situation usually do and what do they consider fair? That is something that 
can not only complement your contract, but it has a good potential to really overthrow what you write into the contract. It's a very important principle in Finnish law, and that means that uh, you are well advised not to test the limits of what you can do in a contract too much. I mean, when you go there and there, how many, many rights of your opponent can you still exclude before it being an unfair contract? It's very hard to say. Uh, in order to have a functional contract in Finland, you are really required to uh, reflect the interests of the parties at least to a fair amount, and to a real degree, and not only see the, the one party's interests. I am now trying to put this concept into a timeline. Again, we start with the document that you are seeing, a signed contract document. Now there comes the arrow, that's the timeline. And you will see that uh, before that document is ever signed, you have a, a, an amount of circumstances that have an impact on that contract. Uh, how have you negotiated? What kind of things have you discussed? And, and with what arguments? What kind of information was exchanged? What kind of promises were made? All this will influence the contents of your contract, even if you don't write it into the document. Then after the document has been signed, there's um, project time factors that impact. That's what I just referred to as common practices, ad hoc agreements. Um, the parties will conduct their business and will find ways to muddle through problems and uh, situations that they have not anticipated. And uh, Finnish law gives those uh, practices very soon a binding property. And then you cannot really deviate from that anymore without again agreeing with your partner on it. And then in the end, maybe your project has ended, but you are in dispute with your partner. Then there's judiciary discretion. Um, the judges in Finland, as I have alluded to already, have a wide discretion of uh, applying fairness to contracts. They may set aside individual clauses, they may set aside even the whole contract if they think it's unfair and uh, replace clauses by what they think is the right thing to do. So um, uh, it's a good idea to write your contract with the thought that you should always be able to explain to an outsider, to a court or an arbitrator, why you have written this, why you have excluded this or that right, why you have set this or that time deadline, and so on, so that it is understood and not uh, overthrown in court later. I will come back to the question of ad hoc agreements, because that is very important in construction, and that's why we're here. Uh, you know, of course, that when you have a construction project that things change all the time. You have uh, scope changes, specifications change, pricing may change, circumstances in the in the market, suddenly a supplier becomes gets bankrupt and you need to, you need to procure your uh, material from somewhere else for a different price. Everything is, uh, is at flow and uh, then the Parties react to that and uh, and agree how to deal with such a change, with such a development, and uh, then they may dispute whether such an agreement is actually valid. I mean, look at a uh, site where you say I have to buy 10,000 nails more because we have more stuff to nail, and uh, then two persons at the site agree. That, uh, that those nails should be procured and paid by the employer. Uh, is that a binding contract? The contract may say change orders can be done only in writing, change orders can be done only by a specific person. Uh, that is a strategy that is very uh, likely to fail under Finnish law because um, if there were the only two persons on the side that could actually discuss this matter and they discussed it in good faith, then usually these agreements are 
considered binding, even if proper authorization was not there. So you look at a person's position and the general situation, you see the persons who have done this agreement, who have entered into this agreement, were the right persons at the right time. They were there to do the business. There was no one else in, who was higher in the hierarchy. So they did it and that's okay. So um, this is a good approach to make projects work uh, on a practical level. If you want to control what's happening to your project, then you are well advised to look at authorizations, not only from formal level, but also practically. You, may, you must make sure that there's always someone available at the site for your contract partners to discuss matters that may come up. If you don't make sure of that, then they will discuss the matter anyway with whoever they find on the site. Our third main chapter is now very um, relevant for construction projects. The title is Relevance of Industry Terms. You will soon see what that means. First of all, I will tell you a couple of words about um, legal rules for contract types. I already mentioned that there is written law in Finland, but not so much. You have legal provisions for a couple of standard project ag uh, contract agreements, purchase of goods, rent of apartments, lease of business premises, employment contracts, all standard stuff. But then you have a huge field of contract types that are lacking any type of legal uh, rules that would be written down in legislation. Here's the example list of uh, such contracts, service agreements, construction contracts as a whole, engineering, consulting licenses, you name it, it's all, uh, these are all contracts that are very, very relevant for the construction industry and they're all without legal rules. So what do we do about that? The textbooks say that um, that's not a problem because uh, the general uh, rules of uh, contract law applies. So you look into a textbook and see how are contracts made and how are they changed and it doesn't really help you very much in practice. The industries have recognized that problem and have uh, helped themselves by making those rules themselves. Um, so there are various industry associations that have uh, entered into actually extensive work in order to set up uh, standard contract terms that are supposed to be used in certain types of contract. Very important for construction is USE 1998. Um, USE is just for general contract terms in Finland, so it's not very imaginative. Uh, that is uh, now already a bit aged set of rules, but it is used very widely in construction projects. Uh, we have KSE for consulting including supervision of construction projects. We have IT terms for, well, as the name says it, IT projects. And we have a, a whole bunch of various standard terms for different uh, contract types in the, the um, machinery delivery sector. So what, what does it mean? What are those terms? Um, first of all, it is important to understand that these terms are private documents. They are not a law. They are they don't have any formal standing, but uh, they are documents that have been drafted by uh, many persons, by associations, and they are actually sold for money uh, because they are subject to copyright and uh, everyone can buy them and then apply them in their contracts. Um, so they are really only directly relevant if you write into the contract, we will apply the reset terms for this construction project. Um, so far so good. That is not so different from any other standard contract terms in other countries. But the main issue here is that these terms are extremely widely used. We do not see many construction contracts that do not use the USA 1998 terms. Really it's, there are some, of course, in, in international projects when there's cross-border contract negotiations, but at least in, in domestic construction projects, I'd say it's probably 90% at least. 
I al already mentioned that uh, research material is scarce in Finland. I can tell you if you want to find out something about the legal status of contracts in the construction sector that do not use the USA terms, then you are out of luck. Absolutely all, juris uh, all uh, legislation, not all um, um, uh, case law and all legal writing uh, refers to USA contracts and uh, interprets the various terms of USA as if it would be the law. So obviously there's a good reason to use these terms, but you don't need to. Um, but even if you don't use the terms, you need to know them because when you come to Finland and you make business with Finnish construction uh, partners, then the, the USA terms will form the background of what your partners will consider normal and fair. So um, when you go and, and uh, negotiate a contract with them, uh, you must be aware that when you depart substantially from what is written in the USA terms, then you can do that, but you may encounter increasing resistance. Resistance, by the way, also means that it's going to be more, more expensive because uh, a contract that your partner does not understand so well will always pose bigger risks for them, so they will uh, ask for a higher price. So, I will now look into change management, mostly from the perspective of the user terms, because that's what uh, is the general practice in Finland that you will have to deal with when you come to Finland to do business. So, when there's a change, the employer, the client, the customer, instructs that the contractor do the works, works differently than originally envisioned. First question is, of course, is that a change at all, or is that still what was agreed before? Second question, if it is a change, is the contractor obliged to do that? In general, of course, you, contracts cannot be changed unilaterally, but the user terms do allow that. We will come to that. Um, third and uh, maybe most important question, if you implement the change, can you ask for more money and time? I'm trying to... My remote control is dead, so I will just push these buttons. Types of changes, yeah. We have two types of changes under, under the user terms. First of all, of course, you have to figure out, do we have a change at all? So you go to the contract, you go to the specifications and see what was agreed. And uh, then you, uh, you look at what the employer is demanding. If that's something else than what is under the contract, then that's a change. Um, there are two types, modifications and additional work. Modifications, that's uh, something when you have uh, something that is in the scope, but then you do it a bit differently. A design change, an amount change, you have to deliver a, bit, a few more nails, as I mentioned. Um, under the USA terms, the contractor has an obligation to implement the change as long as it is a modification. That, of course, protects the employer's interest because uh, every project changes and uh, still the employer needs security that the project will be finished. Um, the contractor is protected as well because the contractor has the right to refuse if the modification would significantly alter the nature of the contract work. Well, what does that mean? I mean, you were supposed to um, build a house, now you should build a motorway. That's, of course, a dramatic dramatic change. You don't need to do that. Also, when the when the amounts change very, very much, I mean, you were supposed to build uh, one house, but now you're supposed to build three. That's not necessarily anymore the same nature of project. So, so in principle, the contractor may refuse. Uh, the second type then is additional work, and the definition of what additional work is, is actually pretty easy is everything that is not a modification. So when you have a, something that changes the nature of your of your uh, performance, then that's additional work. 
and uh, the contractor is not obliged to do that unless an agreement with the employer is found. Uh, I will come to one aspect that uh, uh, leads to questioning this result a bit because sometimes it's not easy to actually refuse to do such work. Let's look at modifications first. You remember modifications are such changes that are still in the scope or close to the scope so that the contractor must comply. But of course, the contractor has a right to claim the effects on price and project time. So the process under the user terms is as follows. First, the employer notifies of a change. The contractor is then expected to issue a change tender in which the contractor outlines exactly what would be the cost effect, what would be the time schedule effect of such a change. The employer will then uh, examine this tender, may agree or may not agree. Um, if everything goes well, then both parties are in agreement. They will uh, make a change agreement in which the effects you know, in terms of costs and time are laid down. And only after that, the change will be implemented. This is the procedure that uh, the user terms foresee. Of course, we have a one, one big if here because we need a written agreement. What happens if there is no agreement? Then there are two options. Either the employer decides to um, forego the change just that if it's so expensive, then we don't need to change the contract. That's one possibility. More often than that, the employer will demand that the work, that the change will be implemented anyway, because the employer needs that change. So the employer will issue a disputed work instruction. This means that the employer says, you contractor must comply with my change request, although we have not agreed on what the effects are. And if such a disputed work instruction is given, then the contractor under the user terms indeed must comply. The effects will then be figured out later by negotiation or by arbitration or litigation. Let's also take a look at additional work. You remember that's everything that is uh, too much to be only a modification. We remember that uh, in that case, there was no obligation for the contractor to implement. That means that uh, implementation will happen only when the parties actually agree on the implementation, including price, time of execution, effects on time schedule, and so on. But again, we come to the possibility of disputed work instructions. A disputed work instruction is possible when there is a modification and the parties cannot agree on the effects, but it is also possible when there is a change and the parties cannot agree whether it's a modification or additional work or whether it's in the scope. So basically all disagreements between the parties can be overcome by uh, disputed work instruction. And again, the um, com contractor is required to comply and the effects will be figured out later. I run through this slide because that basically reiterates what I just uh, told you. And this was in quite a nutshell the background, the legal background for construction work in Finland. There is a lot more to tell. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Of course, we are also here to answer your questions on the phone or otherwise we're looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you, Peter, uh, for this uh, presentation. So far, we have no questions in the chat, but I would maybe have a quick question. You mentioned the possibility of a dispute a couple of times. Could you maybe say a few words how common it is in Finland to use either litigation or arbitration? And maybe also what would be your advice in this respect? Yes, yes, I'm happy to. Actually, um, 
interestingly, the USIT terms uh, leave that question open. So uh, they have a dispute resolution clause that only says that the parties should make an agreement on whether whether to use litigation or arbitration. That, as such, maybe already already gives an impression on that that arbitration is not something that is considered exotic in Finland. It's actually quite common, and it's also rooted in 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 the properties of Finnish court procedure. I already mentioned before that that uh, court procedures are public, not only the hearings, but also the pleadings. It's uh, pretty difficult to keep your business secrets safe. It's uh, also time consuming. Actually, maybe a court hearing or one instance in a, in a public court is maybe not longer than uh, than in arbitration, but then you have an appeal and then again uh, an appeal to the Supreme Court and and it can take many years to come to a conclusion there. Uh, arbitration gets you uh, to your targets quicker. Uh, so, so Finnish companies are very comfortable with arbitration and in business contracts between uh, B2B and between Finnish companies we see a uh, big proportion, maybe more than more than a half of the uh, contracts that have a substantial value have arbitration clauses. And that's also something that's, that I would suggest, especially also in international contracts, because uh, in international contracts it's there's additional difficulty in public courts that you have to litigate and finish, and uh, you certainly uh, have suffer a certain hit if you are litigating against a Finnish company in front of Finnish courts. That's uh, that's there's always the chance that there's a home advantage mm -hmm. for the other side. So so there are many good reasons to use arbitration. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have no questions in the chat, um, but as we mentioned, uh, you are of course free to contact us also after this webinar. Uh, if you still have questions, you will re uh, receive all the presentations of today uh, together with the contact details of the speakers. Also, please make use of the possibility to fix a meeting with Maritz. <laughs> And maybe I would like to point out that uh, we have also published some information on the topic. Uh, we have a booklet on contracting in Finland that you can download from our website if you're interested. Yes, that uh, concludes our webinar of today. We really hope that this was useful for you and uh, we would of course be happy um, if we could um, welcome you soon again to a similar seminar. But until then, uh, we wish you a really nice rest of the afternoon and um, goodbye from our side.